the initial shock was just how massive, complex the coffee manufacturing side is. Whether you're talking about the sourcing of beans, also literally the manufacturing piece of it, the diversity of equipment needed, the diversity of capabilities of, there's just a ton of science that goes in the process of turning a crop, which is coffee coming from the fruit from a coffee cherry plant, and turning that into this fine ground product that you are brewing and drinking. The nuances in between that to uphold integrity of that is the really enjoyable part of the science that you don't know until you peek behind that curtain, fall down the rabbit hole, and the learning process begins from there. Access to goods is still an issue for millions of people around the world, but recently e-commerce has been leveling the playing field. With so many direct-to-consumer operations in business today, the average consumer has more choice and therefore more access than ever before. But there's one industry that stands out as lagging behind this trend, coffee. That's one of the reasons that Purnell Cesar co-founded Black & Bold Specialty Beverages. Purnell is a longtime coffee lover and saw an opportunity to turn that passion into a business that could also make a social impact. Historically, coffee has been hyper-local, but he envisioned a business model that democratized access and brought specialty coffee to everyone. The only problem was that neither Purnell nor his co-founder had any experience in the coffee business other than as consumers. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, Purnell reveals how they were able to turn Black & Bold into a nationally distributed product, including how they turned a mission-driven e-commerce business into a retail one by securing partnerships with places like Whole Foods and Target. Plus, he explains the importance of giving potential customers multiple ways to find your product. And he talks about the value of finding mentors to help you fill in your blind spots. So grab your favorite cup of joe and enjoy this episode. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Hey listeners, it's Stephanie. Before we dive into the episode, I want to let you in on a little secret. Did you know that Mission has the number one e-commerce newsletter? It's amazing. It has really good news and insights and case studies that you will not find anywhere else. So go subscribe, mission.org slash up next in commerce. All right, on to the show. Hey, everyone, and welcome back. This is Stephanie Postles, and you're listening to Up Next in Commerce. Today on the show, we have Purnell Cesar. He's a co-founder and the CEO of Black & Bold Specialty Beverages. Purnell, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show. I actually just saw some of your coffees in a Whole Foods around here. I was like, hey. He's joining us. So it was, it was perfect oh, timing. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, I'd love, I love to it. hear love a little bit about Black and Bold. What is it? And let's dive right into your founding story because I know you have a good one. Sure thing. Yeah, so Black and Bold, we are a coffee roastery out of Des Moines, Iowa, uh, founded about two and a half years ago, really from uh, the the length of conversations that my childhood best friend, uh, who's actually my co-founder, his name is Rod. I'm likely referenced him a few times here. Him and I had just from being teenagers, you know, talking about whatever till uh, being professionals and being time strapped and wanting to make sure that we were spending our dollars more consciously to support initiatives that we really felt we didn't have a lot of time to put into like we wanted to. And uh, after, you know, so much ideation uh, around our ritualistic beverages and coffee and tea, we really decided to focus on connecting everyday consumers back to uh, their community by way of uh, turning those beverages into vehicles for impact and uh, in which we launched Black and Bold with the initiative to uh, tangibly give back to disadvantaged youth by way of giving 5% of our profits back to uh, initiatives across the U.S. that service was specifically that demographic, uh, but then also making specialty coffee and the delicacy of you know coffee and tea more accessible in conventional spaces where people uh, shop already and not have it be confined to you know, the uh, independent shops that exist in, in, in neighborhoods across the U.S. Very cool. So how did you decide to start with coffee? Because I read you didn't really have a background in that. And I was watching your video where you guys were 
starting it, I think in your garage and you're trying to figure out what buttons to press. And it was really fun just seeing how like you really didn't know what you were doing. Like, how did you land on that idea and decide like, this is the one? Yeah. Um, so you know, professionally, I, I didn't really come from the coffee industry per se. And however, as a consumer, I mean, I have years of experience as a consumer right? and, You're a pro. and going across. Yeah, exactly. And going across that, that, that journey, I always call it the, the coffee uh, spectrum uh, in the sense of, you know, what you like and what you don't like. And uh, that's really where, you know, the curiosity uh, bug hit us where just, traveling so much professionally at one stint of my career and I just kind of became immersed with the coffee shop culture, right? Visiting, you know, city A, city B, city C and falling in love with these different shops, but they all have different menus. And mm -hmm. so you, you learn to appreciate, you know, the different tiers of coffee, especially the, the specialty coffee, the more premium side of things and really enjoyed that. But, you know, again, the accessibility of these different experiences or product experiences that we learned was hard to, consistently access and uh, it then became a matter of like okay well what is this and why is this and from there it was a matter of okay well let me see if i can make this <laughs> and uh that hence the uh sample roaster journey back in our garage with you know the complexity of it went down the rabbit hole from there so i always equate it to people that have heard someone's you know craft brewing story and starting that journey in their basement uh with a few tools here and there it's, pretty much the, the same approach from you know, a coffee junkie and you know, wanting to learn more about it, but have access to the different things that I was learning. So just kind of took it in our own hands. I love that. So what were some of the biggest surprises when you were trying to find the beans and the equipment and all that? What were some of the, bi the biggest surprises you encountered when starting out? I would say the initial shock was just how massive, complex, um, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the coffee manufacturing side is whether you're talking about, you know, the sourcing of beans, which was part of your question, but also literally the manufacturing piece of it, the diversity of, you know, equipment needed, um, the diversity of capabilities of, there's just a ton of science that goes in the process of, you know, turning a, a crop, which is, you know, coffee coming from, you know, it's the pit of a coffee cherry plant uh, or fruit of a, from a coffee cherry plant and turning that into, you know, this, this fine uh, brown ground, you know, um, yeah. you know, product that you are, you know, brewing and drinking and, uh, you know, the nuances in between that to uphold integrity of that is really like the, the really enjoyable part of the science that just, you don't know until you, you know, peek behind that, 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 that curtain fall down the rabbit hole and then the, the learning process begins from there. So it's one that it's not as difficult to fall in love with if you're curious because of the many nuances and ways it becomes an art after, after getting going. That's very cool. And did you guys launch e-commerce first or were you also exploring retail as well? How did you think about that launch? Sure thing. So the, I would say our go to Mac market strategy is much more cemented in our ideation of building the brand up front. And so to make more sense out of that. So for us, you know, looking at building a brand and coffee in, you know, the modern day coffee climate, mind you, pre-COVID, of uh, <laughs> the modern day coffee climate where you have independent shops and then you have, of course, the, the conventional grocery aisles and the lack of accessibility, but you also have e-com continuing to be ingrained in people's lifestyle every, and purchasing habits every single day. Uh, but when you look at part of the reason of why coffee hadn't been accessible so much in more conventional spaces and you know, on e-com is because of how hyper-local the product is. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the hold that the coffee shop culture has on people's, uh, you know, behaviors and, you know, what they, they their preference is. And, uh, for us, it was a matter of, well, we are looking to shift the economics of how uh, currency impacts uh, domestic youth. And in order to do that in the commodity category, you have to be able to scale it. And if we go into shops, the margin is much tighter, where we, it's harder to make a sustainable contribution. But if we manufacture and we wholesale, it gives us more room to make the contribution more sustainable. And by way of that, we need to make more access and scalable environments such as retailer distribution and or e-com. And so 
in thinking of that and understanding that, but knowing that, all right, well, we're going after this with little you no know, resources, self-funded, and, you know, with our own validation and learning curve to go from that. And so we for sure launched with Ecom uh, is our, you know, fastest point of entry, but also a place for us to validate the concept. And so, you know, our e-commerce platform as well as social media, the idea of well, there's there's tons of, you know, uh, micro roasters that pop up every day. All right. But uh, to pop up, but also with a very different uh, rhetoric on being, you know, this domestic impact model, um, we needed to find validation that consumers were interested in that as well. And so very long winded answer to uh, yes, e-com was the way we started very much part of our DNA in the sense of being able to own our message and also provide accessibility for people, given that we don't have um, our own storefront. Yeah. I love that you started with the social impact model to kind of drive what results you wanted. I mean, how much did that really push you to think bigger and be like, I'm not just going to, you know, go to one of the coffee shops and sell to them. Like we need big results with our model. And to do that, we need the wholesale model. We need retailers. We need e-commerce. We need like everything. Yep. We have to believe up front, right, and, and build a hypothesis for a business that the sediments that re- resonated with us on there being a void of values and tangible values that were relevant for us, right, that other people, if that opportunity existed, would align to that as well. And because of, of that, that allowed us to really focus uh, up front on, on what channels make the most sense, I guess. And so the the shift in consumer behavior right, and the validation from consumers shifting their behavior, I want to back up and say not behavior, more so than mindset, right? We want consumers to still consume coffee, consume specialty coffee, but we want them to know that brand B versus their, you know, their brand A actually has a different value proposition that mm-hmm. allows you to extend your impact without really changing your behavior. And that allows us to actually become considered a lot earlier than, you know, going at it in a more conventional way. And so that was very much key for us in the sense of how do we make it easy for people to extend an impact without having to change their behavior, uh, which allows us to then get them on board, allows us to get retailers on board, allows us to get businesses on board all around, you know, shifting the, the, the commerce to be able to scale the impact. Uh, domestically. So it's little much of of a lift for everyday people, but to have a much more um, relevant, tangible, sustained impact. Got it. Yeah. And it seems like that story and that messaging definitely helped put you guys on the radar of a lot of new customers. Was that one of the key ways that you acquired new customers and they found out about you was getting that messaging out there and getting that PR out there of like what you guys stood for to then bring in new clients or were there other tactics you used to bring in your first customers? Yeah, no doubt. I, there's a, there's a, there's a fine balance because um, for us, we, we look at multiple let's call it entry points right, or, or, or propositions for where someone, we can be in someone's consideration set. And then mm-hmm. as they enter into understanding our brand and they learn more about what we, what we stand for. And ideally, right, one, if not all of them, resonate as well, right? And that strengthens the loyalty of if they have loyalty to the product, if they entered us through the product proposition uh, and or, you know, from a brand values, and then they also love the product. And so the storyline, no doubt, allows for accessibility when we are introduced to someone. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you launch on Amazon? Because I saw you guys are listed there. Like, when did you decide it was the right time to list it on Amazon? Yeah, so Amazon was always part of our model as well. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it was a matter of the the prioritization of the learning curve. So we launched June first of twenty eighteen. We had our core uh, coffee items at Q four of twenty eighteen set up, and uh, it was really a matter of just you know having them active so we can learn. Right, and you can kick the wheels and <laughs> make sure that you know we're not uh, doing more mm-hmm. harm being on Amazon than not. And yep. Not. Not for Amazon's sake, but for, you know, again, the learning curve. And then, yeah. um, again, transitioning into 20, let's see, throughout 2019, you know, the trial and error of learning that. But then with 2020 and prior, let's call it this, 2019 was a matter of being digitally native, but ramping up and preparing to launch in brick and mortar. And so once we got past that, that milestone at the beginning of 2020, of course, fast forward 
COVID. And that allowed us, being on Amazon allowed us to pivot more fully into maturing what that experience, that digital experience on Amazon looked like. And so while we were on Amazon, let's call it about 15 months uh, prior to launching our formal storefront, um, mm-hmm. You know, when we launched our formal storefront uh, in early April this year, that's where we really were able to drive people to who we are, what we represented in a way that it was much more convertible, given that people were the shift of coffee um, and consumerism and accessibility changed completely, of course, because of COVID. So. Yep. So essentially, you were shifting over to retail and then COVID hit and then you were like, OK, and now back to Amazon, back to our platform. And you kind of had to quickly change once the world started changing. For sure. I think the benefit was that we were already digitally native and, you know, our, our site being kind of the hero experience, having an extension, you know, by way of Amazon and the, the size of, 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 of traffic and, 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 and use consumers they have. Right? But mm-hmm. no doubt when it became time to diversify our revenue streams, fortunately, we were much further ahead of what the Amazon experience uh, looked like than more of the uh, it's called the indie boutique micro roasters that relied on shops right and didn't have a digital experience they had to then begin the learning process um as well and so yeah you're already ahead of the game yeah for, fortunately the, the the case study for us was a matter of can we build a can we get you know accelerate our awareness curve what we stand for in order to convert enough people at a healthy enough rate <laughs> um, that without having a shop, we can convince enough consumers to purchase more uh, coffee for home or those that were buying coffee in conventional grocery areas, that the quality and the value proposition of a slightly higher price point is still worth it for them, at least to get them brought, bought in. And so the shift of COVID and states closing and uh, shops uh, being closed and it's completely changed the necessity of everyday people to have to purchase more for home. And we were fortunate on the front end of that from just from a digital standpoint. Brick and mortar as well, because of the timing of us launching uh, was just ahead of, you know, the pandemic really, really showing its face, but the digital piece was, was definitely huge. Yeah. Yeah, before we get into brick and mortar, I wanna dive a bit more into how you sell on Amazon. Like how, yeah. how does it differ when you sell on Amazon or what are you seeing right now versus your customers that maybe buy from your website or customers that even buy from target.com or something? Like, do you have different messaging or what kind of things are you seeing behind the scenes? Yeah, so I, we offer singles uh, as well as uh, bundles, two packs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just from a sheer economic standpoint, you know, one of the, the old challenges from being a omnichannel brand that also lives on Amazon is retail price, you know, the disruption of, of an everyday price with the retailer versus what it shows up on Amazon. And so for us, you know, we work through Amazon's fulfillment centers and uh, allows us to control control the price. But from a bundle standpoint, it, all, it allows us to ensure that we have the same product proposition, but in no way, shape or form, any pricing activity would disrupt because they're different, you know, from a item count standpoint, different experiences. And so, yeah. You know, that was a, a core piece of how we start, stood up our business initially. Some of our bundle items do uh, better than our singles. Uh, the ones that don't do better do uh, just as, as strong. And so seeing people go on Amazon really as a basket builder, it, it has been huge. And even from in a, a, a awareness play, when the amount of users that uh, Amazon has, uh, you know, we focus specifically our, our, our consumer acquisition on Amazon platform. So we don't really focus on driving people to Amazon because there's so much space to play and win within Amazon um, mm-hmm. as we're still early on as well. So the other pieces as our, our site continue to build, we have seen pure incrementality from the Amazon uh, platform where we don't see you know the shift of trading one consumer from one to the other. And it's very key to being an awareness play uh, for us, but then just, we have to also come back to the reality of you know consumer dynamics and what does the social landscape look like? What does the economical landscape look like that's impacting those consumers? And the focus on supporting small businesses, supporting Black-owned businesses, you know, and then the accessibility of specialty coffee. You know, the people are much more intentional about whether they want to save a dollar for Amazon or shave two days off for Amazon versus support 
individuals that are trying to build their businesses and, and support them where margin is much more supportive and favorable. And yep. you know, we've seen the incrementality on both sides from consumers that are you know, more mature on Amazon and those that are really looking to put their dollar further into the business to support the businesses during these times. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I mean, is so your users on Amazon, do they seem stickier? Because I often think about like when I'm checking out, you know, whether it's through using Whole Foods or whatever on Amazon, they always give me the recommendations or they're like, here, just buy this again. And I'm very quick to be like, okay, sure. And it seems like I'm a very sticky user when it comes to reorders. How does that customer profile from your Amazon customers seem to differ from people who, you know, are maybe just going direct to your website because they want to make sure to support the business and the message. And, you know, they understand that like by going there directly, it's probably going to help margins and um, the story behind it. To a certain degree, our, our, like our engagement is really high on our platform and with our community and our email list, um, as well as on social. And so we get a lot of stickiness from our existing community and bringing them in. And so, um, you know, from an anecdotal read, there's just a significant amount of loyalty, not just to what we're doing, but what we're offering. And, you know, people, our subscription business is really strong on our site. And, um, you know, when we do drop new launches, we also see a quick adoption on those as well. And so uh, we have much more flexibility on those, like we just launched a limited edition collection and just ahead of the holiday season. And we're able to fluidly do that where in Amazon you have, while it's not brick and mortar, you still have to have much more lead time built into that mm -hmm. versus being nimble as a small business. And so even in putting that something out there that adds a little bit more complexity, it's incremental from an experience, from a product standpoint, our consumers also still high, uh, highly converted on that, even though we have a strong subscription business. Right? So the Amazon piece is what we see is also you know, very sticky, but we still have much more conventional tactics on you know, whether it's a price promotion here or there or you know, um, the uh, affiliate programs that come from press that are driving to Amazon. We see those strong conversion pickups as well. Mm -hmm. But I would say, again, from an incrementality, you know, we're pleased with the learnings that we have right now from the stickiness of, but at the end of the day, we're still, you know, from the recording of today, we are still in this pandemic and trying to navigate life through it. And the loyalty from coffee uh, <laughs> isn't going away anytime soon. And so I think people, wherever they're most comfortable with shopping, are still highly susceptible to converting yeah. uh, because they know that they, they need that fuel. Yeah, I think that's really smart as you were mentioning, to develop a different kind of experience on your website, not only with subscriptions, but also limited edition drops you get early access to and developing that community seems key. How do you go about keeping, I mean, not only curating and developing a community, but also keeping them engaged for the long term? Yep, no doubt. Um, I think the most important piece of this, uh, of this is uh, no doubt customer service and experience. Uh, what we don't want to be is you know, a one-trick pony in the sense of, hey, we can do these two things really well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because coffee is very vast. And as I mentioned earlier, the spectrum of coffee um, is really wide. And so uh, we don't want to be too linear on, you know, offering only certain roasts or offering only certain flavor profiles, whereas, you know, as people either discover new brands or their options of how they access, uh, safely access, uh, their daily fix of, of coffee or caffeine that, you know, we then, you know, fall at lower in the consideration or we just have to lean on whatever consumer habits that they had in the current, but will then be in the past, right? And so for us, it's a matter of continuing to diversify, evolve what the experience and options are on our platform in particular and try to drive, you know, our email list and drive as many people to our email, I mean, our site so we can capture and engage with them so we can continue to evolve with them on their coffee journey right? and make sure that our offering is, is healthy enough um, that we can do that without gridlocking our operations and uh, distribution priorities. Got it. So let's talk a bit about retail. So you're in some good stores. I mean, I saw you're in Whole Foods, Target, and I was reading a bit about how you got in front of these retailers. I think you were going to sourcing call events where they had like pop-up events. And I was wondering... I mean, how did you get in front of these retailers? How did you pique their interest? And what was that process like? For sure. Uh, one, a big piece of Black and Bold and my, 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 my co-founder um, and I, 
bringing this to life was our formal background prior to. So we launched this in our thirties, our early thirties and uh, Rod's background being in of uh, philanthropy and fundraising with you know, higher education, healthcare and uh, mine being in you know, corporate merchandising, uh, brand business development around packaged goods. And so the lens that we took to the white space of coffee was a byproduct of what lanes exist within coffee. And the understanding that the accessibility gap was huge when you stepped out of a premium specialty coffee shop that's in neighborhood A somewhere <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and trying to carry that across the country. And so understanding that, you know, we know where they, the opportunity is, which again, e-com retailer shelves. Now we have to build something viable enough that allows for them to consider us from whatever the right starting point is and, and you know, from the way those re- retailers test or minimally launch. And so our journey throughout 2018 and 2019 was operations, learning curve, and um, validation of consumer market. And so we did a ton of road shows, just consumer shows, engaging them on the product. And, you know, the mm-hmm. aha moments for most of them were the uh, 5% for our youth model that we have. It wasn't where they were introduced to us. It was a supplementary uh, validation for them. And so it's continuing to drive yep. that part. But then also just from, you know, formal background within retail, understanding that, you know, there's different engagement points. We are a uh, certified mi- minority business enterprise, which is, I guess, a national certification of that organizations out like that, where they have shows. And, you know, we, there's tons of industries that attend these to, to meet uh, diverse uh, or minority-owned businesses. Um, and fortunately for us, we have visibility to uh, select retailers that uh, attended these as well. In addition to digital platforms, there's one called uh, Range Me, for those that are not familiar, that is a virtual marketplace for uh, packaged goods brands and and merchants, which is hyper dependent right in today's climate um, with corporations not allowing people to travel. And so knowing where to start and having something viable uh, was number one. Number two is being a student of those retailers' aisles, understanding who was in the competitive space, how long they were there, what assortment they were, they were there for, so you can understand what their core consumer was, but then what you know value proposition um, do we incrementally bring for that merchant? What problem are we solving for that merchant? And so that was a big piece of you know, when we had our opportunity to engage with these different retailers, Target, for an example, we understood what value proposition we were looking to bring to them. The conversation from there became a matter of readiness operationally and organizationally to be able to launch and, and sustainably start with the intention, of course, sustainably growing. So. And was there a bit of back and forth with the retailers when they're like, we're interested, we love your model, the coffee's great. Were they giving you any guidance on, you know, here's what we think will do well on the shelves or here to, here's how to set yourself apart? Or was that really all on you guys to do the research, figure it out and present, you know, here's some maybe new packaging that we think will do well at Whole Foods? For sure. It definitely can. It can be either way. We So we had our first, um, let's call it national launch or a major launch was with uh, Target Corporation uh, at the beginning of this year uh, on about 300, it's called 350 stores across the major markets uh, within the U.S. And mm-hmm. the conversation and the process of having that launch was about a nine month process from introduction to essentially the product arriving on the shelf. And from, you know, the initial alignment, we were invited. This was from our social media engagement. And um, fortunately, you know, uh, word of mouth being passed on to uh, to target for a show that they were having. We received an invite and we're fortunate to uh, have an introduction with the coffee buyer, you know, allowed us to further conversation. All right, this is our, 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 not only our business model, but our, our case that, you know, the consumer that we're looking to capture and the incrementality of that consumer to retail. But then uh, that buyer also helped us understand, you know, what its strategic priorities were in the sense of how his space is set up and where there may be room to identify the incrementality if it's really there. And so the feedback on the, the core consumer that we're going after and aligning on that uh, was very real. And quite honestly for us, like, while we had that opportunity to have the connection and the conversation, we knew we weren't ready uh, because where our packaging was, right, we had a, a checklist of, of key things that we wanted to accomplish before we entered onto a shelf so we can have our best mm-hmm. foot forward. And we were halfway through that checklist. And so, 
the merchant to, hey, well, when do you think you're ready? Well, here's the key things that we need to accomplish. B Corp certification was one, which was we hadn't got through the finish line on it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and the rebrand on the packaging and also some of our operational scalability. And so uh, that nine month journey was really with, you know, understanding the strategic vision values and knowing that, you know, with accomplishing that, we can have a, a solid start together to go push it through. And then, so in, in January with that launch, then gave us the opportunity to credibly approach other merchants um, with them understanding that you know, we were already vetted and well, well equipped to enter into their, their shells as well if we had the same alignment on the value proposition. So the Whole Foods conversation was a lot more in the sense of, hey, we see what you're doing here. Here's some of the assortment that uh, you have that we think will work really well. Here's some feedback on what may not be yet, but let's get started and let's find out together. And, yeah. and so it was much more collaborative in the starting point. And of course, from my experience, that's exactly what you want. If you're mm -hmm. pitching to retailers with uh, the hope that they will take whatever you're pitching, hey, or, you know, what, hey, you'll take, I make the perfect pitch, they didn't ask me a question, they're going to take it. Well, the risk is that they don't understand enough of where your blind spots may be. And you all yeah, find you want out a partner. To, yeah, yeah, you all will find out together. And that's the last thing, because it's really expensive to back out of distribution. So, yeah. anywho. I mean, that's so smart. I love the idea that you had the checklist going into it and you were open with Target. Like, here's the things that we need to knock out. Tell me a bit more about what else was on that checklist and why were they important? Like, why were you looking to get, um, have that B Corp certification and what else was on the checklist on top of that? Sure thing. Yeah. Um, the B Corp, I would say, is a major one. I have to remember some of the smaller ones, but the B Corp was a major one. Mainly from being from being in retail and, and you know, once you learn about B Corp, it's hard to unsee it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it being a you know, it's essentially a, a independent organization that certifies businesses with those that value stakeholders equivalent with shareholders. And so for perfect purpose being equally as important as for profit. And you have organizations like Ben and Jerry's, Tom Shoes, Warby Parker. Patagonia, um, you know, these, these major organizations that are all a B Corp that continue to, you know, move into you know, improving society while, again, building sustainable businesses. And uh, for us with, you know, having this domestic social impact focus that the model doesn't exist. And it's unfortunate it doesn't, but that's also a core reason of why we decided to go into this space. And knowing that given that it doesn't, it doesn't exist and at the scale that we have to start at, we want it to be taken serious to our consumers and our stakeholders on the intention of where we're going uh, while we yeah. work on getting there. And so as we, with a launch into retail and being on the national stage, we took it very serious to make sure that we had, you know, third party validation vetted out already for us, you know, for people that That's great. engage with the brand. Yeah. And are there, so I don't know much about corp structures. So are there also benefits that come with being a B Corp? Yep. So there's, there's different tiers of, so there's a, uh, you can incorporate it as a B Corp as, if your state has that as a, uh, you know, a legal option. And that, I think there's some different tax implications for being a, you know, a, a legal B Corporation. Um, mm -hmm. And then there, for states that don't, and this is the way that was initially set up, is that there's a certification and you're certified by it's called B Labs, uh, which is the you know umbrella organization. So you're certified by B Labs, and then you know as they continue to build momentum and further penetrate their models, where the states began to allow it to be a legal entity structure. Got it. Very cool. And then tell me a bit about so you're getting into these you know new retail locations and you're working on your packaging and getting certifications. Tell me about how you guys were preparing for the orders. Like, what were you doing behind the scenes with distribution and logistics and setting up partnerships? What did that look like? <laughs> chaos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Craziness, to say the least. <laughs> yep. Chaos. Chaos. Um, so, you know, again, self-funded bootstrap and never want to put the cart before the horse. Uh, it was really a matter of, you know, trusting our forecasts and building enough bandwidth to at least get through the initial hump. Of a, of a national launch. And so then and still today, we do everything in house. Um, you know, we source and we work with our importers. They, they move the goods, right, with their exporter partners. But, you know, we are identifying, um, you know, what origins we want to source through, where 
doing all of the, the, the testing, cupping, and validating the integrity of you know, what we're putting into our product. We uh, micro roast in house, we package in house, and you know, we work with shipping partners to get goods out the door. And so at the time, you know, we had graduated from the garage <laughs> and into uh, a shared uh, production space with the local brewery. You know, that's where we had our, our commercial roaster and we essentially had to, you know, tighten up our ship, bring a few, uh, bring on board a few individuals that had coffee background in roasting and, um, and packaging to help us get the target launch out of the, out of the door. And so that was a mad hustle because here's where we are. Here's the bandwidth we have. Let's if we're at 100% capacity, sometimes a little bit more than that, <laughs> to, to get the, uh, the launch out of the door with the intention of, you know, sourcing a new location um, that we can grow into. And so uh, fast forwarding that story, we had identified a location and we're closing the deal in March. And of course, pandemic <laughs> changed all of that. And yep. so, um, you know, we found ourselves still uh, running idle in that location for a while, but it wasn't with a, a, a bevy of um, orders and, and things until we start getting further into the summer. And that's when we got kind of flooded <laughs> in yep. that space with orders and so on and so forth. So if you were to look back and change anything, what things would you have done different if you were to start again? It can't be everything. You just got to pick be like, there's this one thing when I was setting up my partners or distribution or with the retailers, I would have maybe done this differently. Huh. It's tough because there's, there's, yeah, you did. And the main reasons because like uh, uh, there's so many learnings and this sounds so cliche and that's why I was trying to prevent sounding so cliche, but there's so many learnings that if I didn't learn them then, I'm going to have to learn them later and I just don't yeah. know it yet. And yeah. so, uh, because we're continuously learning and it's not just about coffee but it's about you know you're you're in the space where we are looking to win over over the long-term consumers into not only what product we're selling but the impact that we're selling and you know there's so many curves along the way and so i am happy to have the learnings that we do have in the bank yeah. uh checked off i think more so it's a matter of how do we continue to broaden um our view to mitigate blind spots one of the, what I would say is one of the things that was uh, hugely helpful early on as we were like initially launching with literally our hearts on our shoulder was uh, sharing what we were looking to build with some other professionals, um, you know, just more mentor related uh, people in the network and uh, so informal mentors that fortunately connected me to a formal mentor that was previously, well, executive within the industry and just gave me a history download on how coffee in the industry came to be. And oh, that good. in itself just broadened context more so than why you have to, you know, you're you know, crossing T's and dotting I's and every single step of the process, but to have that broader context of how, you know, the, the industry around you kind of got to its point, just fast forwarded that blind spot for sure. Yeah, so now we're just that. trying to color it all in. Yeah. So do you think mentorship has, I mean, do you have other mentors right now that you rely on or that help when it comes to guidance or kind of showcasing like what else is happening in the industry or e-commerce as a whole that you kind of lean on? Yes and no. Student, I, I, yes and no. Um, informal, for sure. Students of work, without a doubt. I think it's uh, important to have a broad uh, lens on what's working across different industries in digital mm -hmm. in particular. And so if you rely on someone that's hyper-focused on a particular industry, then it may mitigate you from having your antennas up to learn about other things that are working elsewhere. But informal, yes. <laughs> um, but tapping into kind of what's working for them and, 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 uh, and learning from there. It's really hard. This may be a, a me statement, but I'm sure it may resonate with someone else out there. It's really hard to move at the speed of entrepreneurship and startup and to have someone that isn't as intimate with your business to mm -hmm. give you specific guidance on building the business, more so than giving you more visibility to things that work and that exist. That, you know, so it allows you yeah. to be able to align closer and jump in the rabbit holes further that you know may be in the path where, where you're going. So much work is done offline that <laughs> having visibility to things allow you to dive into it without having to bottleneck someone else's time in doing so. 
Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's really good advice. And like a mentor might be able to give you a higher level, you know, ideas or, you know, industry level things or maybe connections. But I think it's the same thing when it comes to investors. Like the second someone starts giving you like really nitty gritty advice on like what you should do, you might want to be a little wary of that because you know your business best and you know where you're headed. Mm -hmm. So what's next for Black and Bold? Where are you guys headed? What are you betting on right now? Sure. Well, we're still we're still young, and uh, awareness is still important. And accessibility is still important. You know, the the more traction we get, the more we can further cement uh, our contribution model. And you know, now that we've cracked the door open, it, it, even minimally in the product assortment that we we do exist in, the more immediate is to continue to 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 round out our accessibility, but with our key partners that have strategic alignment with us. Uh, and so we have retailers that we're on board with today, Target, Whole Foods, Hy-Vee in the Midwest. And so from an e-com standpoint, home base is home base. <laughs> and so we're going to continue to pour into our website to be more proactive in how we drive engagement, but also acquisition. And also, you know, we're selling a tangible good. And so while that's key and that's great, we also have to look at supply chain, not only efficiencies, but innovation that's out there to allow for us to continue to connect and win with convenience and accessibility from a what that means from a D2C space as well. And so uh, we we got some you know some ideas under our belt <laughs> on you know some strategic partnerships that can uh, allow us to further that. But n without a doubt, continuing to further uh, further develop our D2C and the more important pieces that help our community uh, be more transparent with how we are building and continue to uh, support from an impact model, but also to build more loyalty for people that come in to to see it in action. And so. That's awesome. And I'm excited to see, especially that B2B piece too. I mean, I think that could be such a strong partnership. I mean, I used to work at Google and I think about the road shows they would do and having, you know, companies come and all the employees would test out the coffees and the chocolate and all that. And uh, that could be huge and yeah, very smart partnership to have that B2B angle in there. Mm -hmm. No doubt. All right. So with a couple minutes left, let's move over to the lightning round brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. This is where I'm going to send a question your way and you have a minute or less to answer. Are you ready, Pernell? We'll find out. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's up next on your Netflix queue? Oh, gosh. I just Googled this yesterday. The un... Doing? <laughs> I think that's that what it's called. <laughs> well, we just ran through all the Shit's Creek, so um, okay. TBD on Netflix. <laughs> all right, there you go. And I've got uh, Hillary in this document saying, it's amazing, and it's on HBO. So that works. Love it. Love it. Love <laughs> all right. It. What's up next on your reading list? Oh, my gosh. Besides emails? <laughs> yes, besides emails. It doesn't count. <laughs> oh, man. Um, it's a great question. I, 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 I digest so much content through, like, just online that if I'm looking at something tangible, it, it might literally be a roasters, uh, roasters magazine. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We have not stay had anyone say a roasters magazine. Yeah. Stay in the anecdotal, uh, know <laughs> what's going on. So <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. If you were to have a podcast, what would it be about and who would your first guest be? Oh goodness. First guest would be Rod, my partner, what it would be about. Yeah. I don't know, the random things we come up with throughout a day, which is a plenty and most people don't get to see or experience. Uh, you're building, you know, something with a, a best friend you have for over 20 years. You can only imagine the, the randomness that comes about within the day. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I could see that being really fun. Purnell and Rod's musings. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. That's great. What topic or trend or theme do you not understand today that you wish you did that i don't that i wish oh my yeah. gosh um you know <laughs> i this sounds terrible but twitter <laughs> <laughs> That's I, okay i i tried to figure out my twitter game early on when everyone else was and i was just too loyal to facebook and now here i am still trying to figure out how to not like tweet on the wrong thing or something so <laughs> oh me too me too well yeah. what's your twitter handle we'll get you some followers here uh it's pernell caesar <laughs> i think it's just oh my, my gosh name. you don't even know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's know. the problem pernell you don't even yep. know your handle no i actually yep. don't know if i know mine either we uh, we'll, uh, we'll link it up in the show notes there you go okay. 
Touche. <laughs> All right, then the last one, what one thing will have the biggest impact on e-commerce in the next year? And it can't be mm. COVID. I know that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, from a from a, a good standpoint, I do think uh, uh, supply chain speed of delivery on native sites and not having to be relying on third-party commerce platforms. We know the behemoths, they, they, they in-house a lot of that and they have major contracts that do that. But you know, the comeback of, you know, boutique independence and owning their future, I think really be a byproduct of uh, independent supply chain companies doing the same thing. So again, from a, from a, from a, a packaged goods or a tangible product lens, but, you know, black and bold can deliver something in a matter of hours and not, you know, having to rely on Amazon that just drives that much more engagement and loyalty for the long term. That's great. Cool. Great answer. All right, Pranel, well, I've had a blast talking to you on here. Where can people try out some black and bold and learn more about you other than Twitter, sure. which apparently they shouldn't go yeah. there right now. Yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't go there. Um, so, but <laughs> on social media platforms, uh, black and bold, spelled B-L-K and bold. And then uh, our website, uh, B-L-K and bold.com. Awesome. Thanks so much, Pranel. It was a blast. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, you'll probably also love our e-commerce newsletter. To get it delivered straight to your inbox every week, sign up at mission.org slash upnextincommerce. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.